Bullshit. Let's pretend for a moment we've entered a parallel universe, free of bullshit marketing and full of bold solutions. That's what the No Bullshit Marketing Podcast is all about. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich, and our guest this episode is Tony Lombardi, a former healthcare chief executive and a past winner of the Lifetime Achievement Healthcare Hero Award. Our Sights and Sounds of Marketing has David Bowie telling us about ch changes and goes back to when everybody was kung fu fighting. But first, let's cut the bullshit. When someone leaves a company, why do they and most of their coworkers rarely stay in touch for more than a few months? How do former bosses and mentors become just memories instead of being part of an ongoing win-win relationship? Why do friendships turn into acquaintances and then move to someone I used to know? The reasons range from trivial to ridiculous, but the relationship was disposable rather than indispensable. How can we avoid this? First, acknowledge there's no such thing as a perfect relationship. Okay, we can all agree on that. The hard part is doing it. For example, instead of only remembering criticism from a former boss, focus on the positives of the relationship. Second, overlook the imperfections in others. I know, another straightforward yet difficult to implement piece of advice. Try not to concentrate on how your former coworkers bugged you. Remember, most days they actually agreed with you and you got along 80% of the time. We all have different expectations from each relationship. Sometimes people don't even realize they're making the relationship one-sided. In other cases, your styles may be completely different and you'll have to compensate by being creative and forgiving. You also might want to tactfully let the other party know where you're coming from and what your expectations are. Look at each relationship in a different light. Make them indispensable rather than disposable, and both parties will reap the benefits. Hey, I never said it was easy. Our guest today is Tony Lombardi. He's riding it on a motorcycle. <laughs> uh, Tony's a former healthcare system CEO who also was involved with the outreach for the American Hospital Association and was board chair of the Hospital Association of Pennsylvania. He's been recognized for his leadership successes with many awards throughout his distinguished career. Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. Well, what's a tool or a tip that you'd offer our audience to help tell their story, craft their message, or to help them with their career? Well, you know, this could be passe right now because, you know, there's more electronic communication going on now than when I was a CEO. I mean, remember, I've been out of it now since 2004, and... Uh, but the one thing that you have, I mean, if you want to have people buy your product, if you want to have people uh, use your service, you have to be sincere. And you can't be a fake sincere. You have to show that sincerity. Now, one of the biggest fundraisers that we started at uh, Monongahela Valley Hospital and is still going today is the annual gala. And... Uh, it's a big, you know, black tie affair once a year. And, uh, oh, my God, we're, we're into millions of dollars uh, of raising at the gala. One of the things that, two things that I did to show people we appreciate that. Number one, we had major sponsors. Now, when you have a gala of, you know, three, four hundred people attending, it's impossible to thank everyone. And yet your major sponsors need to know that they are appreciated. And when I'm speaking major sponsors, I'm speaking 50,000, you know, 20,000, et cetera. They come, but they can be lost in the crowd. So what I did was I started a president's reception an hour before the general reception, where my wife and I stood at the door. And we, had, we developed our management team so that every one of them had a number of major sponsors that they had to, that they were responsible for seeking a donation from. So, you know, if the dietary, uh, 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 the, the head of dietary got a big gift from a produce company, she then came and brought the representative from the produce company to the door where my wife and I stood, said, Tony and Barbara, this is Dave. Dave is from this produce company. Got to shake our hands, got to talk a little about them. How's your family? Where, where do you live? Blah, 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 blah. And then they went in and had their wine and cheese, but every one of them was recognized with my wife and I being at the door and greeting them. The second thing we did 
because you don't ignore those people who come to the gala, even if they're only paying the price of a ticket, which right now is $350 a couple. And, you know, you have a young couple with a couple of kids at home, you know, schmack out $350 and new dress and rent a tuxedo and everything else like that. It's money. So we had their pictures taken during the gala. And uh, once those pictures, now today, you know, you, can, you look at it on the camera, but once those pictures were developed, I had them put in some, you know, in a little little uh, paper frame, and I sent them back to the couple a little note. Just thought you'd enjoy seeing how nice you look at our gala. Just wanted to tell you how much we appreciated you being here. Look forward to seeing you next year. Very truly yours. And there were 500 people at the one gala that I attended. Yeah. And so the audience is thinking, what are you talking about on the pictures? Because now we have the camera and everything. But it doesn't matter that that was ahead of its time. Now you can go to something like the wedding and they hand you your picture right there. But folks, this was whenever, this was a big deal because the week after the gala, the communications department would come over and hand him the, all the pictures. He'd take and make a personal note and send it out. And it goes back to one of my blog posts was about the written thank you and how much more meaningful the written thank you is. We tend to hold on to written thank yous that we get. We keep them mm -hmm. because they mean so much to us. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. You know, and like I said, you know, that could be passe today, but the point that I'm trying to make is that it's a sincerity. Yes. And, 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 and there's no room for bullshit and sincerity. You can't be a bullshitter and sincere at the same time. Exactly. You I know, agree. And people will see that. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite programs, everybody loves Raymond. You know, I'm watching it last night and, uh, you know, uh, Raymond finds out that this other sports caster doesn't like him. He, in fact, said he hates him. So Raymond approaches him and the guy gives Raymond all this bullshit. Oh, no, no, no. I think you're great. I want you to be on my show. And as he turns his head, he rolls his eyes and Raymond catches his roll in his eyes. Well, the guy was a bullshitter. Yes. The guy was a bullshitter. Indeed. Indeed. All right, Tony, it's time for you to keep calm and hit the bullseye, one of our fun segments here. Um, I'll ask you to choose between two marketing or messaging classics and tell me which one you like more, but you only have a couple of seconds to choose and hit the bullseye. So here we go. Geico's Gecko or the Aflac Duck? The Aflac Duck. Doritos for the bold or Lay's Bet You Can't Eat Just One? Lay's Bet You Can't Eat Just One. This is the tough one for you. I know it. Tony Soprano or Michael Corleone? Mm, I'm going to have to say Michael Corleone. But it was tough, wasn't it? It was very tough. <laughs> I'm loving it or have it your way? Have it your way. All the hospital you need or treat your health care as if your life depended on it? <laughs> Can I pass? We'll go with all the hospital you need. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't leave home without it or priceless? Don't leave home without it. Now, see, guys, I know Tony really well, so I've gamed the system here today. Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley? Oh, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> the Old Spice Guy or the most interesting man in the world? The most interesting man in the world. Okay, just say no or this is your brain, this is drugs, this is your brain on drugs. This is your brain on drugs. All right, excellent stuff. So let's recap them a little bit. What made you choose the Aflac Duck? Well, because I think that uh, the Aflac Duck has become almost a household item. You know it now. As soon as you, you know, there, there, there's stuff, there's plush animals that you buy at Christmas time and it goes to a cause. And and I think that, uh, I really think there's a sincerity to that Affleck uh, 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 commercial, whatever you want to call yes. it. I think they really do a good job. I walked into, especially though I was doing my consulting for, you know, workers' compensation and risk management. I walked into many a director of human resources office that saw that Aflac duck sitting on their desk. Uh -huh. As, you know, this is, this is how I keep my employees healthy. Uh -huh. I mean, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, one of the things that we'll get into after this is the sights and sounds. So I don't want to give away the whole thing with the Godfather that you and I have talked about before the show. But uh, when we were together working, the Sopranos were big. Right. And every Monday, right. you'd come in and Everybody at the corporate staff would be talking about the episode. Right. Tell me a little bit about the Sopranos. Well, you know, first of all, I'm a native of Newark, New Jersey. So where was the Sopranos? You know, where, where, where did it take place in New Jersey? Second of all, I'm a full generation. I mean, I'm a full-blooded, you know, uh, uh, second generation Italian. So, you know, so Italian, Newark, New Jersey. And I, I watched the, the program and some of the diners that they were in. I sat in that diner, some of the streets that they passed. I walked those streets. But I really thought that, you know, the program showed that as rough and as tough 
as Tony Soprano could be, he was vulnerable. Yes. You know, he had to see a psychiatrist. Yes. You know, he did care about his son's grades. Yes. He cheated on his wife, but he did love her. You know, I mean, he was vulnerable in so many ways that, you know, he was human. Yes. And I think that's what made the Corleone, uh, the, uh, the, uh, excuse me, I'm mixing up with the guy, but the, the guy, what, what made, uh, the Sopranos a good program. And it was the first of the programs that came out that way where the hero's an anti-hero. Right. You now right. see it with Breaking Bad, Mad right. Men, all right. of them. It's so common right. now, House of Cards. Right. But back then, that was a novel thing that the hero of the show wasn't yeah. wasn't Bill Cosby, who and, at the time was a hero. And that's why I liked Mad Men as well, but I never really liked him as much as I liked Tony Soprano. You just like Mad Men because it made you think of when you and I were working yeah, out with yeah, the advertising. I, mean, I liked him, but some of the things he did... This is this is terrible. I don't know if it's because I'm in New Jersey or because I'm an Italian, but I can compensate for almost everything that Tony did. <laughs> but I couldn't compensate compensate for what Don did all the time. Well, let's touch on a couple other ones. I, I threw in, I rigged it with all the hospital you need, which was Monongahela Valley Hospital's slogan when Tony and I were together. And choose your healthcare is a great slogan from UPMC. But let's go on to uh, Tony is a guy that um, I was really young when I started there, and I let things get to me. I took them too personal, and I've tried to grow. I still take things way too personal, but. It took me a long time to get used to that Tony is uh, wears his heart in his sleeve, his emotions are his emotions. So you could be really mad, you could be screaming at me. Then the next time I'd see you down the hall, you'd be like singing a Frank Sinatra song. <laughs> and like 10 minutes later. And that's why I brought up Sinatra, because you just love him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, you know I, I, I'm an A type personality, but I'm also, you know, I mean, I keep saying it's my Gemini, because my wife says that to me all the time, you know. I mean, you know, how can we be arguing in one minute and next minute you want to go out to dinner? You know? Well, the argument's over. I'm a Gemini. That, that, that's gone and that's over. Now I'm happy, you know? Yes. And it's hard for people to live with me like that. I mean, yes. I blame it on being a Gemini, but maybe it's just because I'm nuts. Well, who knows? You know? Well, there's someone very close to me who shares your personality style. She always stuck up for you, and that's Darlene, my wife. Oh, that's great. <laughs> she's, she's the same way. She'll argue with me, and then yes. so let's go out to dinner. Yes. So uh, now we're going to move on to the sights and sounds of marketing, and I picked this year specifically for a reason that you'll like. And this episode, Sights and Sounds of Marketing, begins with Changes by David Bowie, which was released in 1972. So I take the song, talk a little bit about it, try to use some of the lyrics and apply them to leadership or communications or messaging. The first lyric is, I still don't know what I was waiting for. Some people spend most of their work life in the comfort zone, yet aren't satisfied with their situation. Others hope for that big promotion, new responsibilities, or a boss that will appreciate them. The song says, and my time was running wild. Some maintain the status quo through complacency, procrastination, or indecisiveness as months and years pass by. A million dead-end streets. Others jump jobs, change careers, or move within their company hoping the grass is greener. Every time I thought I got it made, it seemed the taste was not so sweet. Yet the quick fix, risk-free opportunity just doesn't exist, and we've kind of touched on that today with Tony. The song says, so I turned myself to face me. Instead of blaming it on the boss, the company, or the job, do the self-analysis required to learn what you could do to improve the situation. But I've never caught a glimpse of how the others must see the faker. Seek and listen to feedback from peers, bosses, subordinates, and customers so they can tell you what they see and what they think. Turn and face the strange. Figure out the changes you have to make. What makes you tick? Why are you doing what you're doing? Step out of your comfort zone. Stop rationalizing that job security, pay, or benefits mean you can't change. Just going to have to be a different man. Personal and professional growth require ongoing positive change. Develop an action plan with specific goals and do what you need to do. Ch -ch changes. Don't think it's too late or not the right time. Just make it happen. Tony, your thoughts on how people can become complacent if they don't look to continually grow personally and professionally? Well, you know... That can happen when you lose the vision of why you're there. You know, what is this company supposed to be doing and what is my role in the company to do it? And the best way that I can explain that was when we were going through the merger process. First of all, we called it a consolidation because, you know, a merger, one, lo one loses their identity, the other one absorbs it. And, you know, there's all these kind of petty jealousies. So we said, let's make it a consolidation. We both lose our identity and we form a new corporation. Well. There were two hospitals that were six miles apart, and my, my passion for the hospital from the first day I started in 1963 
was it belongs to the community and we need to preserve it for the community. And if it's not for the community, we have no reason to be here. That's why we are a 501c3 corporation, because we don't have stockholders that we have to pay a dividend to. We have shareholders that we have to make sure we're here to meet their needs. So there was a big argument. And I told the board first time, as soon as I became CEO, which was three years after I got there, I was 25 years old, or no, 28 years old, excuse me. Three years after I got there, I became CEO, and I told them then, there are going to be times when you and I are going to disagree. And when it's just a disagreement, it's fine. But when it gets to the point that I cannot do what you want me to do, then I'm going to leave, but I'm not going to badmouth you or say anything about the organization. We're going to leave on peaceful terms. Well, there were two hospitals. One had 21 board members. The other one had 16 board members. So one of the board members calls me into the office and says to me, what are we going to do about X? I said, well, what, what, what about X? He calls me to his office. And I said, he said, well, you know, he has 21 board members. We have 16. We want, to, we want him to get rid of five, and he won't do it. I said, I think X told you go out and get five more. He said, well, we don't want to do that. So I got up, and I drew... I, there was a blackboard in his conference room, and I drew a big circle. And in the, inside the circle, I wrote the patient. I said, now, they got 21, you got 15. They got this specialty, you don't have this specialty. I said, you know, you're going all these crazy things. And I said, and the only one that matters here, and I hit the board so hard with chalk to the word patient, that the chalk broke. And I said, <laughs> and none of you are thinking about the patient. And I stormed out of his conference room. I went home and I told my wife that, you know, despite the fact that you were born and raised in this town, you don't want to leave. You better get ready to pack your bags. <laughs> but, you know, that's it. You know, you become complacent if you lose the reason why you're there. You know, the job security is fine. But if the job security means that you've lost your reason for being, then the job security is bullshit. Yeah, I know you got to put food on the table and you can't think about that all the way. But you don't do it abruptly. You know, you plan and you say to the board, you know what? Or you say to your employer, we're going in different directions. And until our path meets, I'm going to be looking to make a change. I want you to know ahead of time. You know, I hope you can understand this. I know I have to feed my family. But, you know, I know it's idealistic. But if you don't have that, if you don't have a feeling in your gut, a passion in your heart for the job you're doing or for the organization you work there, you don't belong there. Exactly. Some of the other sights and sounds of marketing from 1972 were, Hey, Mikey, he likes it, a life cereal ad. Bob Barker begins hosting the new Price is Right. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. Alka-Seltzer ad campaign. The movie and TV show Kung Fu premiered, and Master Poe asked Young Kane, Do you hear the grasshopper which is at your feet? And White Owl Cigars, sooner or later you're going to try a White Owl. When you do, we got you, was their TV commercial. So let's take each one and just give your thoughts. And sometimes the guest doesn't like one of them or didn't bother with it. And that's okay because marketing is about targeting and reaching a specific target audience. So the first one, the Life Serial ad. Tony, what do you think? I like that ad. Uh, I know the kid was an actor, but yet, you know, he was portraying what kids are. They're sincere, they're honest, they either like it, they don't like it, they like you, they don't like you. They're like, you know, they're almost like, you're, you know, a kid and a dog are synonymous. Your dog either loves you or hates you. Your dog, you, your kid either likes something that you do for them or they don't like it. So I like that ad. It's a very effective ad. Good. Good. How about Bob Barker and The Price is Right? Are you a fan of him at all? Nothing against Bob Barker, but I don't like that show at all. The interesting thing about the show is if it started in 1972, it is still so much part of our pop culture i mean it's still she said, the other day i walked in and it was on in my house i'm like they're watching the prices right i don't like any reality tv nothing at all the only reality tv that i ever watched and for you people out there who are not pittsburghers was i watched every week when heinz war was on dancing with the stars and i had three telephones going and my wife had two going and we voted five times every week for that guy to win that you know ball or whatever you want and that's he the, did yeah and that's he did, the only right? reality he did win, yeah he right? did yeah. that's the only show i ever watched but that's showing your true colors there right. when you're in western pennsylvania <laughs> the steelers drive a lot of what you do there's there's uh you know alec my oldest son his uh baptism party and everything was scheduled around a Steeler game. <laughs> so that's just how we are. So the Elka Seltzer ad, what do you think? I like that. I, I, I liked it because, you know, I mean, uh, 
Uh, I was on over there. I mean, I could sit there and eat the whole pizza. But luckily enough, I went to bed without having to have Alka Seltzer. So I like it. I enjoyed that. Alka Seltzer's had some great campaigns in those yeah, in the 70s yeah, and 80s. Yeah, Speedy Alka Seltzer and all that. that and was great, yeah. Plop Plop Fizz Fizz. Yeah. They were doing some great stuff. So the the reason the TV show I put that on there is I just remember uh, people making fun of it, poking fun at it, like Grasshopper. Uh, what did you think of the TV show and movie? Never saw it. Never saw it. Mm -hmm. How about this one? The vast majority of our audience has never seen a cigarette or cigar commercial on television because in 1972 was the last year of any mm -hmm. tobacco related television commercials. Right. Oh, they had some great ones. I used to smoke three packs a day almost, you know, and uh, they had LSMFT, Lucky Strike Means Fine Tobacco, they had the dancing. Uh, Cigarette by uh, Chesterfield. They had a, a, a big one, a king size one, and one small one dancing. Uh, they had the Marlboro Man. They had some really, really great. And all of them were seductive. All of them were seductive. They had, you know, either pretty girls or, you know, hunky men for the women. And, you know, they, and they seduced you into smoking. And smoking was the thing to do back then. And, you know, this has proven me so wrong because I did not think that the government did the right thing by taking the commercials off. I did not think that uh, all of this banning of smoking places was the right thing. And I said, you know what? Our country went through the, the biggest criminal turmoil in history with prohibition. That's how the mafia made their money. Prohibition. And now we're going to tell people you can't smoke. It's never going to work. But it worked. It worked. And maybe, you know, the government wasn't as much a factor as I think maybe the schools were a factor because the teachers would send the kids home and my daughter would say to me, Daddy, why do you smoke? You know what I mean? And, you know, it was things like that. You know, they talk at your heartstrings, but I never thought it would succeed. I never, ever in my, I would have lost a billion bucks if I bet a billion bucks that this was going to succeed. Interesting stuff. So, Tony, how can listeners contact you if they'd like to learn more about you? What you do is there, and you have a lot of wealth of experience. Is there an email, a Twitter account, LinkedIn, anything you want to? Yeah, they might look in the dictionary, look up the word nut, and they find me there. But you know, no, I do have a, an email, and it's lombardi.tony.jr at gmail.com. I have a business phone. I still keep because I guess I'm. I still think that I'm in business at my old age. Uh, Seven two four. Four eight three one five six zero, which is also my fax number, and you know that's what they can, they can good. find. Good, good. Well, I hope people take it up on you because uh, you have a lot of great ideas and energy. So, Tony, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I, it was a pleasure. I, first of all, you know we had a great working relationship, and I admire so much what you what you do. I mean, I I I, I respect so much thank you. how you grew in your career, and the fact that you asked me to be on this. It was a real honor for me, so I appreciate you having me on. Uh, thank you, man. The feeling is mutual. I mean, I genuinely love you, dude. So it was uh, learned a lot from you, and we got a lot done. For our audience, thanks for joining us for the uh, No Bullshit Marketing Podcast. Visit BoldSolutionsNoBS.com for show notes, plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Sign up for Light Reading. You'll receive proven strategies every other week to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light tended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. To sign up, visit massolutions.biz slash blog. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions.